Thank you, Ann. You said so much about me, there's not much more for me to say about me. <laughs> so, I brought my card up here so I remember what I'm talking about today. Uh, my gift to you today is uh, no PowerPoint or slide deck. Uh, it's just going to be real time me talking about uh, my subject on leadership. Uh, and also, I think because we have a lot of uh, students, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my career path and uh, uh, what was ahead of me in the windshield about 44 years ago, but is now all, all, uh, mostly in the rearview mirror. Um, but uh, I realized today that you're really looking forward and uh, trying to put myself back in your shoes of, of where I was uh, in the great unknown. So. Um, my story starts uh, growing up on a farm in northwestern Wisconsin, uh, moving to the big city uh, when I was 17, I graduated young. Uh, I selected Dunwoody. I think one of the reasons Dunwoody appealed to me, uh, if you can picture growing up on a farm, you kind of learn by doing. It's hands-on. Uh, I was self-taught uh, to be very good in mechanical things. from. I think fixing bicycles at age 6, the lawnmowers at age 10, and tractors at 12 and 13. Uh, so I was kind of a mechanical marvel at a young age. Um, so what appealed to me at Dunwoody, I think, was learning by doing applied learning. I, I couldn't picture myself in a classroom uh, listening to professors lecture, but uh, needed to have, have a, a, an adequate amount of hands-on learning, which uh, if you're going here, obviously you're drawn to the same types of things you want to learn uh, by doing, so uh, that was attractive. Uh, interestingly enough, I picked a career I knew nothing about. I uh, wasn't even sure how much interest I had in it. I grew up uh, with mechanical background, and, uh, and I was trying to decide between uh, uh, auto mechanics and electronics. <laughs> and those are two pretty... Uh, different things. I picked electronics because I didn't know anything about it. And one thing about my career uh, uh, constant is curiosity and, and understanding and knowing things and continuing to learn. So uh, here you have TVs and radios and stereos and all these things, and I have no idea how they work. And that really bothered me. Like I, I need to know how they work. So I picked something I knew nothing about. A little history about Dunwoody back in those days. Uh, you were on a monthly system. Uh, you went month by month. You had to pass the curriculum every month or you flunked. And you had to start all over or choose another career. So it was a little bit of a pressure to, to come in and perform every month uh, and, and meet that, uh, that threshold. Uh, I can also tell you that tuition, uh, and this was out-of-state tuition. Out-of-state tuition was $100 a month. <laughs> so, so that dates me. Um, but anyway, I guess the point I made is I knew nothing about electronics. I came in a uh, class with, uh, with uh, uh, other classmates that had been in uh, the Twin Cities schools that had actually electronic courses, so they came in with some understanding. A lot of uh, vets and be, uh, uh, that were in the classes that had electronics and, and were in this monthly system of, of, uh, of competition to to learn, and all I knew was Ohm's Law, so I, <laughs> I had to get up to speed uh, pretty quick. Uh, and I remember the first few months were very uh, difficult, but then I uh, got into the scheme of things. Uh, so, after I graduated, um, my first job was at Eastman Kodak, uh, and I worked uh, servicing uh, radiography equipment, uh, uh, motion uh, film uh, processing equipment, and those things, and I did that I always say I did that until I met my wife. I met my wife at Eastman Kodak uh, and very quickly decided I didn't think our lives should be Kodak-centric where all our friends and, and driving to work together and going home together was just a little bit too much. So I spent about two years there. Uh, and then I made a change uh, which uh, was uh, pretty odd for me. You wouldn't picture me back then as being a salesperson. I was probably the farthest thing from a salesperson. Uh, in fact, I, I despise salespeople, <laughs> and then I became one. Um, but they had a job in electronics of servicing. Um, uh, this was a, a large-scale scoreboard that you'd see at stadiums, time and temperature signs, message centers, anything with moving outdoor lights. And it was a service job, and the head of sales had decided, we're going to combine sales and service, and, and we're going to have people do both. So I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. I can work with what I know with my hands and electronics, 
and then uh, it's probably a, kind of a low barrier of entry sales job. So uh, I did both, and I found I actually enjoyed sales, and I was actually pretty good at it, uh, surprisingly. I uh, didn't know exactly why, but it didn't matter. I was good at it. Um, and then uh, that idea quickly fizzled after about a year. They realized, well, you can't have salespeople and service people together. They're two different types. And, uh, and I was forced to choose, and I chose sales. But I guess my point being, I had a, a, an opportunity for a year to actually try it out, and probably something that I wouldn't have done, and my career would have went a totally different way. Uh, so after that, I spent about 25, 30 years in sales. Uh, quickly rose to a district manager, I think, in two years, a regional manager in four years, uh, and I was an executive uh, vice president of sales, corporate officer, public company, uh, in about 12 years after I graduated. Uh, so uh, I obviously enjoyed what I did um, uh, and had some practical skill at uh, sales uh, management uh, and did it for a long time. Worked mostly in electronics. Uh, uh, I talked about uh, the message centers and things I worked in, but uh, that became selling more advertising. I wanted to get into electronics, so I got into uh, really high-tech electronics. Most of my career was in uh, ultra-miniature devices, making microchip modules smaller than any place uh, else that could make those. Uh, started out uh, with a company uh, I spent 18 years at with uh, the name of HEI. When I came there, uh, head of sales and marketing, it was a regional company. Uh, as we developed, it became a national company. Uh, and when I left, we were an international company. We exported more sales than we did domestically. That's how much the company had changed. Uh, in very, uh, uh, in markets for very small, small precision electronics, disk drives, canal hearing aids, implantable electronics, those types of things. One thing, um, I guess I'll point out, in, in having talked about all of that, um, I didn't know anything about marketing. And I'm, I'm, I'm vice president of marketing, and I was really learning uh, to be a sales leader on the job. I didn't, really, you know, Dunwoody really didn't prepare me for, the, for those things. So I had, to, I had to continue to learn and practice that, um, which again, going back to, I had a very curious mind to want to understand and learn new things. I also had a lot of confidence to not ever be intimidated, I couldn't do anything. So when you start marketing on a national basis and then you start marketing internationally, my largest account was in uh, Siemens in Germany uh, and I had accounts all over the world and, and, and selling it to different cultures, I kind of thrived on that. But again, mostly because I had the, had the curiosity to learn different cultures, learn new skill sets, learn how to market in different countries. Uh, and throughout my career, I did that uh, probably with three different companies where we went from national to international markets. Uh, so the message there is when you graduate, you're going to have to continue to learn. Uh, Dunwoody gives you a platform, they give you a foundation and a skill set. They give you a, uh, a card in the game of business, uh, but it's just a beginning hand. Uh, your hand has to continue to change and evolve if you want to in your career. Uh, I didn't, my career wasn't shaped by goals that I had. I didn't have goals of, of being a senior sales executive and goals of being a CEO. Um, I think I had uh, the smarts to recognize decisions I could make and opportunities I could choose uh, to take on and uh, probably the courage to try new things uh, uh, that other people perhaps wouldn't try or put a barrier up because, well, I don't know how to do that, so I'm not going to do it. Well, I was kind of the opposite. Um, if I didn't want to do it, you couldn't convince me that I wouldn't be able to. Uh, I got a little bit of a story about that. Um, uh, when I looked at raising my kids in the cities versus uh, my growing up in a small country school, I had a class of 32 in high school, a high school about 110. Uh, let's see, I was... I was a class officer two years. I was on the football team, the track team, the basketball team. I was in FFA. I was in choir. I was in band. I was in pep band. I was in the school play. I was an FFA officer for two years. I did all these things. I, and I was allowed to do all these things because all you had to do was raise your hand and you were in. <laughs> um, my definition of a good football player was if in, in our, our school, if you're a good football player, you played offense and defense. <laughs> but you just showed up and you're in. So, 
What that taught me is you can do anything you want to do. I, I came here at 17 to Dunwoody thinking, oh, I can do anything, because I had. I was given the opportunity, uh, and I profiled that against my kids growing up in the cities. Uh, I had three sons, two of them were really good baseball players. One works in baseball today, and, uh, and they tried out for the baseball team. Now, there's 200 kids that try out for four positions, <laughs> and obviously they didn't make that cut. And I, and, I, and I look at that and I say, well, what does that show them versus what did my life show me? And it just gave me that confidence uh, uh, to, to try new things. And perhaps that shaped my, my career more than anything was just the courage to not be intimidated or define myself. Uh, so my message to the students out there is don't define yourself by, by how others look at you, how you perhaps look at yourself. Don't limit yourself too much. Um, you may not have grown up the way I have, but I think you can talk yourself and give yourself that confidence that you can do, you know, I'm an ordinary guy that did extraordinary things. I'm not an extraordinary guy. <laughs> I'm an ordinary guy that made the right choices, that uh, probably wasn't intimidated to try new things, and uh, and that kind of shaped my life. Let's see how I'm doing on time with a capital wander here. Um, so I was a first time CEO, I went from uh, Senior Vice President of Sales to CEO in 2007. I was what you would call a reluctant CEO because I had been offered uh, a path to that position about, probably about 10 years earlier and I always said no. <laughs> I had so much enjoyment um, working in sales and marketing and, and kind of be giving the keys to strategy. I uh, did four, four turnarounds, strategic turnarounds of companies that were failing. Uh, redefined those companies strategically by reinventing value propositions. Uh, I did that with the senior staff, and I led as a peer on that staff, not as the CEO. Um, and I enjoyed that. My fear was, uh, being a CEO, I wouldn't be as involved, and I couldn't lead the same way that I could lead from the middle, by being one of the people on there and uh, uh, versus what I saw in a CEO. So I kind of shied away from that until 2007. It was kind of uh, dumped in my lap. Or, and I always I remember I told my sales team, you know, and they knew very well I didn't want to be a CEO. And then I had to announce that I was taking the CEO job. And I remember when I announced that, I said, I'm going to tell you something, but but when I do, don't, don't say what you said. Uh, because I knew that they would, they would say that. <laughs> And they did. So I uh, became a CEO of a company called Zariba Systems, a small public company. I was on that board prior to becoming CEO for about uh, two to three years, and then took the CEO position when that company was starting to fail. And I had, again, a background in turnarounds, and I took that position. We turned that company around, uh, and we sold it in about two years uh, to a large private company. It was a small public, and it needed to be taken in a private uh, environment. And uh, from there, I had this nice severance package of an 18-month severance, and I thought I was going to take a sabbatical. Uh, but I was recruited in about, uh, well, I started the recruiting process about two weeks after I was um, uh, gone because we uh, had merged that company in, uh, and started my journey with Geotech in Rochester, Minnesota. And I was CEO there for about uh, six years. Uh, and gave you a lot of the stats on that uh, company. Um, one stat we don't talk too much about, that company in 2010 was about uh, $15 million, and it's about $65 million today. Uh, shareholder value uh, uh, in 2010 was, uh, it was owned by private equity, granted equity, about $30 a share, uh, and it's about $345 a share right now, so it was a 10 time increase in shareholder equity, shareholder value. So that was a, a chance to really scale up the company on a, on a significant uh, level uh, that I got to experience versus doing turnarounds. So uh, enjoyed that uh, immensely too. Uh, as of two years ago, I've moved from uh, what I call active senior management to board governance. And that's the change in my career where I serve as uh, board chair on two boards with a different kind of leadership. Uh, because you're not actively uh, man, uh, working in the enterprise, but you're governing it outside to ensure that it's meeting shareholder expectations, uh, also to mentor 
as a board chair, you mentored the CEO. So I go, I went from being a CEO to mentoring uh, two CEOs. Uh, we just hired a brand new CEO at Allflex uh, in Northfield, and uh, so I have an active role there, and I also mentored my uh, replacement, so I learned those skills. So I've kind of set the table a little bit on, on my uh, my talk today, my talk was labeled strategic leadership that is measurable by definition. And that, that might even be confusing to even sort that out in your head what that means, um, but I'll try to uh, fill in the blanks. Um, leadership to me is a big hairy word. If I asked you what leadership was, and I've done this, I would get a lot of different responses because it's really hard to answer that. How do, how do you answer, what is leadership? And, uh, and I find I get a lot of different, I, used to, I mostly get, you mostly get attributes. Well, leadership is, is a person that has integrity, that has vision, it's, it's an honest person, it's a person that's fair, treats all with respect, it has all these uh, attributes. Um, and, I, and I was the same way. Uh, in fact, I would even go back uh, earlier than that, right when you get out of uh, after your graduation from Dunwood, when you think of a leader, leadership, I think you think of the, the first part of that word, leader. You think of it as an authority figure. It's, it's your boss. Uh, that's how I thought of it. It's, it's a person that's in charge. I didn't really think of the attributes of leadership. It's just a, that's my leader. And that's as far into that word of leadership that I got. And then as I got into more senior management, I started, you start thinking about leadership, uh, of course, you're judged and you're you're, uh, you're evaluated on leadership, and then all of a sudden these these these, these attributes come in on these deep, uh, ways are trying to define it by the characteristics that you uh, demonstrate, and that's all well and good. And I went to a lot of seminars and things where they talk about these, but how do you action that? How do you how do you apply attributes to your human character? Your human your your personality already probably has these attributes or it doesn't. It's not, you're not gonna pump new ones in there. You might be able to enhance them. But uh, where I'm going with this, about, um, well, when I came, became CEO, I was exposed to a leadership series. It was a two-day session that uh, Franklin Covey, uh, was based on the Franklin Covey principles of leadership. And that really changed uh, my world relative to what leadership was. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but, but Franklin Covey has four leadership imperatives. And what makes that a definition of leadership that's actionable, it's, it's based on leadership expectations and it's based on leadership outcomes, not attributes. It's what, what do you expect from a leader? So if you measure yourself to what is expected, what are the outcomes, well for me, now I can, I can execute it. Now I know what's expected of me, I can measure it. In fact, when you take the Franklin Covey uh, 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 seminar on leadership, you actually go in with having done uh, 360 interviews with your peers who rate you on these four imperatives I'm about to tell you, and they give you scores. And then after you've gone through the course, you, you get measurements after that to see if your scores are changing and whether you're making improvements in these areas. But bottom line is you come in with a foundational score uh, about something you know nothing about until you're exposed to it with Franklin Covey. So what are the four imperative? First imperative is inspired trust. And it's first for a reason. Uh, inspired trust is the foundation of, of leadership. If you don't have trust, if you don't build trust between yourself and your subordinates and the people that you're leading, uh, they're not gonna follow. They follow people that they trust. They tune out people that they don't trust. So you have to base, base leadership on establishing trust uh, to be trustworthy by the people that you're leading, but to also trust them. Uh, I found my most difficulty with that was being uniform with extending trust to people. Uh, I was very good at extending trust to people that, uh, in my mind, met my expectation, delivered results. I would let them run totally free. In fact, I wouldn't provide any direction, hardly at all, other than very, very high goals. But if people made bad decisions or, in my estimation, did not perform well, I would probably withhold trust. I would start micromanaging more and doing all those things. Um, and, and, that, and that's not going to make that person better in a lot of cases. 
Uh, it's not going to unleash the talent of that individual. Um, so you either have to let them, you either have to stand back and let them make decisions, knowing that they're going to make all good decisions, uh, or you have to realize you get the wrong person in the wrong role, and, and, you, and you have to make a change. And that's, that's one thing that I did when I, I uh, started looking at uh, Inspired Trust and how to be more uniform with mine. The next one is to clarify purpose. And to clarify purpose is to express, uh, it can be uh, expressed in vision, it can be expressed in mission, uh, core values of the company. The one that I rest my hat on being a sales and marketing guy is the customer value proposition. Uh, I did uh, four strategic turnarounds and I always focused on the value proposition. The, value proposi the customer value proposition is just restating mission and vision from a customer's perspective. What, it, what is your value statement? What do you provide to customers that customers value? How is that differentiated from other companies that makes you definable better? If you, if you have that defined, that becomes the purpose that you want to clarify. But if you look at clarifying purpose, if you look at leadership, even from a perspective of a non-manager, and again, I'll, I'll reach out a little bit to students here, you can look at uh, 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 clarifying purpose if you're leading a project, if you're leading a project team, it's your job to be very, very clear on what the purpose, what the expectation, what the outcome is. I've seen a lot of people not be clear on that, and then you get outcomes that are all over the place, or your project failed because you never were clear what you were trying to do. You thought you were, but you never really clarified purpose. So there's things that you can do even as a, as a graduating student, uh, I think, to apply that. The next thing is to align systems. That's the third imperative. If it's fire trust, you've clarified your purpose, but now you've got to align everything that you do as a company to that purpose. And that sounds easy, and it can be easy, but it can also be very hard. <laughs> Uh, if you don't have a, uh, a process in your mind for aligning your systems. If we have time a little later, I will talk a little bit about uh, strategy, another big hairy word in aligning uh, uh, strategy. But it's basically aligning everything that you do, objectives, anything that's going to move the company forward to your purpose. And if your purpose is based on your customer value proposition, it's really putting all the fundamental things that are building value, continuing to building value in that value proposition. Uh, that works for me. And the last thing, if you've done those first thing, is uh, unleashing talent. Now that you've inspired trust, you've clarified purpose, and you've aligned systems, you have to let go and you have to unleash the talent that you have. You've got to support, you've got to mentor the talent that you have, uh, but you let them do the, the work. Uh, one thing you learn as you rise from, from being a, uh, a, a, a doer, a working, person that has a very specific role in the company, to a manager, to a senior manager, to a CEO, you start out as tactical. You're 100% tactical. What you're doing every day is you're doing a job, and it's a tactical job. As you become a manager, you, you become a little more strategic. You've got the strategic element that's maybe 10% of your time, where you're, what's the future of my department? Where are we going? Where are we today? Where do I want to change it? That's strategic. It's not tactical. Uh, when you get all the way to CEO, uh, I don't want to say you're 100% strategic, but you're pretty close. You're probably 95. Uh, as a CEO, you're not doing tactical things. You're not running the company. You're leading the company. You're, you're, you're spending your time figuring out where the markets are going, where you want to move that, that, that company. Um, uh, so you're a strategic uh, person at, at that point. So I talked about leadership by definition uh, that uh, is measurable. So I've given you the four imperatives. And if you look at those imperatives, you can measure yourself. I said that when I started the course, I was actually measured on those. And as a company, we actually measured our, uh, our senior managers to those imperatives. They're part of the job review, clarifying purpose, inspiring trust to get scores on that. So when I say leadership that's measurable by definition, that's what I mean. Now we're not just talking about is that per you know I've seen this on, on reviews is, is is that person a good leader? <laughs> yes or no? But how do you action it? How you're actually measuring to what you believe 
if you buy into what I'm saying or what Franklin Covey says, now you're measuring to outcomes of leadership that matter to a company that make a difference in a company. And that has really worked well for me. And when I look at, again, leadership from where I was graduating to now, I've, I've now got a, an actionable version of leadership that actually uh, makes a difference. It's something that you can measure. It's something that you can uh, set goals for change. I, I gave an example of changing myself when it came to inspiring trust. And I can give you other examples in other areas where I did the same, same thing. So how are we doing on time? Um, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rock my own boat here a little bit. I, I, I've, I've given you a, a definition of leadership based on Franklin Covey. So now let's talk about Steve Jobs. Where do you put Steve Jobs with those four imperatives? Did he uh, inspire trust? Did he clarify purpose? Did he align systems? Did he unleash talent? If you read a lot about Steve Jobs, you, you read a lot of uh, good outcomes and good things that you would say was excellent leadership. He made, a, he made a, a significant difference in three different industries. Who can do that? He made a difference in computers. He, he, he will be written in the history of computer technology as somebody that did something meaningful. He did the same thing with music, with digital downloading and streaming of music. He did the same thing with uh, moving phones to smartphones. Uh, created the graphical user interface, the GUI interface for the the Mac, which today you, you hear Windows, but Windows was just a copy of what Mac already, what Steve Jobs and Apple had already invented on, on the Mac. So he did wonderful things, but then you read all the books about his leadership style, about how uh, difficult he was to work with, how he didn't inspire trust, how he had temper tantrums and he wasn't. So so how can you be a good leader, get those outcomes, if, if you you listen to what I just said about these imperatives, and, and that's where my mind was after I had done this. Well, how do you explain Steve Jobs? And uh, I don't know if I have an answer to that. My answer is I think sometimes on those imperatives you can be exceptionally good at one or two, and you can perhaps round out your flat spots with other senior leaders. I think uh, Steve Jobs was excellent at clarifying purpose. He was a visionary. He knew. He knew where the markets were going and his place in it. And I think people were inspired by that. They were drawn to that. And they wanted to work for that vision that he had. And they put up with all the other things. They, they discounted everything else that he did because his vision was so strong. And if you look at their customers, even today, I mean, how cool is this if people line up for your product at the store when it opens to buy it? I mean, we all talk about driving sales and driving marketing and advertising. They release a new product and people line up for it. I mean, that's, that's, that's vision. That's, that's product uh, leadership uh, to, to do that. I mean, that's a company that's really succeeding, and, and he was a part of that. So I give that as an example because you can, you can go to George Patton and a whole bunch of leaders, and they're not going to fit this profile. But I think you can also look that they probably were very strong at at least one of these, and they probably rounded themselves out with senior staff. Uh, in other areas. And that's another option of leadership. You don't have to be all things. And, and you're not going to be all four of those things in a perfect way. You're going to have flat spots just like I did, but you can also design your staffs and your management team to, to uh, round out your flat spots. But that means you've got to be honest with yourself and, uh, and honest in how you're probably never going to change in certain ways and, and find another, uh, another solution. Um, Let's see, I think I have a, another a, a few minutes before we get into Q&A. I'm going to give you another big hairy word uh, that goes along with leadership because I put the two, in fact, I actually put strategic leadership. And strategy is another big hairy word to me. If I asked you what strategy was, I'd get all kinds of different answers because even myself, it's like, how do you answer what, what is strategy? And uh, I came across a definition of strategy that I brought, bought into about 12 years ago. Uh, and I can probably repeat it because it's a part of me, but <clears throat> strategy is an integrated and aligned set of activities that position a company within an industry for superior results. Strategy is an integrated and aligned set of activities that position a company in an industry for superior results. So strategy isn't a one strategy thing. 
it's aligning everything that you do to something. And I'll go back to the customer value proposition. If you align everything you do to your essence of your value to your customers and what that statement is, that's a very powerful thing. Uh, that was our strategic plan. We aligned everything to what we valued as customers. We grew those things. We added things to that value proposition. It created this laser-like focus of the company to, to become our value proposition, to continue to expand that value proposition. It also kept us on a line in that you always have new opportunities that bring you into new markets and new things, but if it didn't align with our value proposition, we said, well, no, we can't do that, we can't align it. So uh, I bring up that definition of strategy and alignment, if you buy into that, because it's the same thing with aligning with leadership. You've got aligning systems uh, and clarifying purpose and Strategy is the same thing. You, you put those two elements together, you've got strategic leadership. Um, we got to a point where we could list, we put our whole strategic plan on one page. It had mission, vision, values. It had customer value proposition. It had our top line strategies. And every objective, every activity was aligned with those strategies. And the strategies were aligned with the value proposition, with mission, and values. And it was on one page. I gave, I, I went over that one page with every new employee, every production worker, and I could explain strategy for our company in about 10 minutes. I didn't have to go through 65 slides to, to do it. It was very simple, uh, it was understandable, and if it's simple and understandable, you can execute it. So um, that's how I think I would put those, those uh, two things together. So that's my, my evolution of my, my take on leadership, uh, moving from it being a, a kind of a word uh, to something that I actually took to heart as a CEO because that was my primary job was leadership, uh, but also understanding that it was uh, that by definition if, if it's if it's based on outcomes of what's expected of a leader, and if you look at yourself in that mirror, you can you can uh, you can invest in yourself, you can grow yourself in 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 those four strategic imperatives of leadership. Or you can build out your, your management team to make sure that it's rounded out. And I'll again, I'll go back to the Steve Jobs um, uh, example. But you could, there's other ways of doing it. But I think you have to recognize that your employees expect those things out of leadership. Those are the outcomes of it. So that's my talk on leadership. So I think I will. Thank you, Dale, for your, for your speech. Questions. If anybody's got questions for Dale, we're happy to ask.